Welcome everyone. Um, it's a lot of you, so many of you. I can see some familiar faces in the crowd. Bear with me, I haven't done this in two years, so I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, I've done a lot of this online recently, but it's glad to be back in London. It's glad to see uh, all of you here. So, this is a picture of a scooter or a mop, uh, people will call it in the UK, and of a server. Now, you might be wondering why am I showing this picture in a DevOps, uh, in a DevOps talk. So, I want to tell you a story. So when I was living in my hometown in Naples more than 20 years ago, um, I was working for a telecommunication company, and this company would provide um, access to the internet, to the broadband, with, you know, uh, to, to many users. So we did not have really the infrastructure to run the broadband ourselves, but we would run kind of the authentication and the authorization uh, service for, for, for this company. And everything actually was handled by that server over there, called Argo. So, and that's actually, it's not really a picture of Argo itself, but Argo looked very much like, like, like that. And you know, Argo was somebody that we knew, he was part of the team, you know, uh, when we walked into the office in the morning, we will go and check on Argo, you know, is it okay, is it too cold, you know, is it too warm, how, how is it doing? Um, and Argo was very important for us, you know, Argo had been with us for a few years, and you know, he would handle all of the authentication, all of the authorization. He would actually let our business going, you know, and uh, yeah, pay for our salary and, and everything else. Now, one day there was a power cut into the office where we were uh, having uh, Argo, and so uh, Argo crashed and and it stopped. And so suddenly we could not authorize, you know, people going onto the internet. So kind of the whole area of Naples was kind of you know blacked out. You could not authenticate. You could not log in online and things like that. What do we do? We cannot replace Argo. You know, there is no other Argo. That's the only one that we have. We don't even know what's going on in Argo. We can't recreate a new Argo you know, in hours, in minutes. It would take us months to, do, to take another Argo. So what did I do? I unplugged Argo very carefully, trying to not hurt it. I put it on my scooter, which would look like very much like that. <laughs> and then I started driving as fast as I could you know, from the office to my house, actually my parents' house. You know. And I arrived there. I took Argo off of the scooter. I plugged it in. You know, into my uh, small bedroom. I was 18 at the time, so like a very much like a teenager bedroom. I phoned up the company that we were partnering with. Uh, I, I gave them, you know, the IP of my actual connection at home, and they say, look, from now on, please redirect all of your requests to this IP. Argo lives again into my bedroom. <laughs> now, now actually, you know, we could restore the service, and it worked. Actually. Argo was so loud, you know, like he had this like very big fan, you know, to actually not, uh, you know, warm, warm, heat, heat up too, too, too much, that then one night I could not sleep. I could not sleep with Argo, so I had to unplug it again, and I had to move it in the living room, and that's where I caused like the biggest outage, because then I could not get it back online, but it gets kind of, you know, an, another story. Why am I telling you this story? It's because there was a time, which, many of us may not remember, depending on how old are you, where physical computer and servers, they were very important. They were unreplaceable. They were unique. I'm Dom. Uh, I'm a principal engineer at Chronomics. Uh, so Chronomics is a uh, uh, biotech company. We're building uh, an awesome bioinfrastructure. If you want to hear about Chronomics, please come and talk to me. Uh, the one thing I think it's important to know about myself, I might have a slight Italian accent, and I'm going to talk very fast. So if I'm not clear enough, please ask, uh, you know, let me know, I will repeat uh, myself. Okay, so what we want to talk to you about today is how did we go, how did we get from Argo, you know, 20 years ago, to you know, running functions into the cloud that power actually you know, business critical application and allow us to make some money. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about you know, infrastructure as, as code and you know, what, what does it mean today and what could it mean into the future. So in the past, you know, we had physical servers. Actually, you know, they looked, they were much nice looking than, than Argo, so they were a kind of you know, smaller rack that we could actually uh, plug in. 
Um, and then you know, we had on one side kind of the software engineers, the developers, you know, writing the code, and then on the other side we had kind of the operational people making sure that the server would run, that would have not crashed, that they were you know, connected to the internet, uh, that they were patched regularly. And kind of those two worlds were, you know, uh, the, the kind of things that you would do on a, on a daily basis, you know, were very, very different. Like from a, an operational perspective, you might do procurement work, you know, getting in touch with um, a companies where you would buy those servers, you will physically assemble them, you know, we will kind of replace, you know, hardware components. Um, and there wasn't so much around, you know, DevOps as much. Like you would not really write code, you know, to make things work. Maybe some scripting, a little bit like that, but it wasn't kind of the main gist of the work. And then on the other side, you had developers that, you know, they would write code, um, create application, you know, maybe package them if you were lagging, hand them over to Office. Okay, here's the thing. Go and run it on a server. So I guess the distance between those two worlds and ways of working and tooling, you know, was quite significant. And then what happened after that, virtualization came in. And this, uh, I guess, allowed to um, start you know, working, collaborating a little bit more uh, uh, together. And we were like, starting to share some, some tools. You know, so we will see some more scripting and configuration going on. The collaboration increased as well, because now maybe you know, we as DevOps, you know, we could actually uh, give developers tooling to maybe create their own VM. This is still very much a world where though um, virtual machines were kind of long lived, you know, they had the name, you know, they, they were not kind of ephemeral uh, kind of things. So I guess there was still some distance in, you know, what do we do, how do we do it, you know, responsibility. I guess the line were very kind of firm and there was a very much uh, big separation of concerns. And then, Docker came, you know, containerization, should I say, uh, which in my opinion it was kind of the biggest shift in mentality at the time and the thing really that brought, you know, those two kind of words uh, together. And this is where, you know, um, as software engineers, you know, we stopped thinking about, oh, I need to run, you know, my application on a computer, on a, on a, on a server, on a VM. And we st started to think more about in terms of uh, uh, processes. And you know, how much capacity do we need to run this application in terms of maybe CPUs and, and RAM? And things you know, started to become more ephemeral. You know, like the idea that you know, I could spin up a process to run my application, throw that process away. I don't really care now where the process is running. And this is also was in terms of tooling, you know, really started to collaborate and talk, starting to speak and talk, you know, the same language. Like, you know, if you were using Kubernetes, you know, you would kind of understand how Helm work and that would be like, you know, on both, on both sides. Um, and also, I think this is where from a, an operational, you know, deployment uh, perspective, you know, software engineers will start to take some ownership, I guess, where the ownership will start to be shared, you know, between those kind of two, uh, two teams. So I think, in this story, I think that you know, the, the advent of Docker containerization has been kind of the, um, the most significant shift that we've seen in kind of bringing those two worlds together. And then kind of the serverless movement, I guess, started with the idea that don't worry about container, you know, don't worry about processes, uh, you know, just write some code, you know, it will run for you, you know, somewhere, uh, somehow. And I think this is where, you know, we, they, did, they did bring, you know, somehow those two words together, but in, in, in some way, I think he also maybe and made them far away a little bit uh, again, because now there is this constant battle about, you know, what happens to DevOps in a kind of serverless world, you know, who, there, there are no servers to manage or patch, right? And, and that's not really true, and we're gonna see, we're gonna see that why. But um, this, the promise of serverless, uh, it's about, there is no ops, and also it's about, uh, this is kind of, you know, the quickest way, you know, to be productive and to create application and to run businesses. But I think it's my opinion, you know, the, 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 the distance between those two worlds and, and then the productivity that comes out of it is still quite significant. And the, and the reason I say that is because, you know, the tooling and the ecosystem and the languages that you know we use to write the code and the infrastructure is, is still quite different, right? So on this picture here, you can see on the right hand side it's some code, uh, you know, like the, the, some actually you know lambda function code, uh, and uh, on the left hand side this is an example of serverless using the serverless framework, which is one of the framework that you can use to manage your serverless application. But on the left hand side we do have some 
I don't know how to call it, YAML scripting kind of language where you define the infrastructure. So you see that you know, the infrastructure uh, definition is still separate from, from the actual application code. So we're still thinking you know, at this being two kind of separate worlds, although much closer together than it was you know, with Argo and the end application that I, I did write at the time, but it's still, uh, still different. So the question to me is kind of, no, what's next? Is this kind of, you know, have we reached kind of, you know, the plateau in terms of, you know, uh, the, the, the most effective way of writing system, you know, business critical application, or is there anything else that we can do to even, you know, speed and boost up that kind of productivity to go from, I have an idea, I'm running a business on this idea, you know, uh, the quickest possible. Okay. So to try to answer that question, I reflect a little bit on infrastructure as code, um, and the idea that you know, we write code to define infrastructure, which is still very much the case in serverless as well. Like if we go back a couple of slides, on the left-hand side, that code is just about the infrastructure. It does not tell me anything about the application. It does not tell me anything about the business logic and you know, what my application does. And, and you know, infrastructure as code is a big topic right now, and many people are saying that's where you should invest your time. You know, that's where uh, we need to automate everything. You know, we need to automate and code our infrastructure. And I guess whilst that's true today, I don't think that you know it is going to be true tomorrow. I know this is a little scary, maybe a little bit controversial, but uh, I'm going to explain it why. And this is my opinion; it might be wrong. But I do not think that infrastructure as code, at least as we think about it today, is going to make us win in the next you know, five uh, to 10 years. Because I think what's happening, like the, the, sh the shift that we see in our industry is that we start to think about you know, systems as a whole over infrastructure and application. Kind of the line between those two things is kind of becoming you know, more blurry. I don't know if blurry is the right word, but you see, like things are merging together every day, and I guess that means a lot for both kind of you know DevOps and operation and software engineers, where the role might be merging at some point. I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to go that far, but um, I think that definitely kind of skills and knowledge on both sides. You know, there, there will be I guess some collaboration increase. You know, skill exchanging and that kind of stuff that we need to happen. So actually. I lied to you a little bit. Imagine I'm not going to talk about infrastructure as code, uh, but I'm going to be talking about two kind of different emerging, I guess, way of uh, building systems, uh, which are uh, maybe what could be kind of the, the evolution of infrastructure as code, um, which would be platform as code and infrastructure from code. And uh, a little bit of a disclaimer here. Uh, we're going to write some code. So what could go wrong? So I'm going to try to show you how this works, because I think it's best to kind of look at an example. And I'm going to use uh, two particular tools of framework uh, to show this. I am in, by no means an expert in the tool I'm going to show. I just think that they are a good implementation of the patent that I want to talk to you about. And so uh, I think yeah, that they, I can express some of the ideas that I want to share with you quite uh, clearly with those. Um, so yeah, please bear with me. You know, I might not have all the answer about those tools as I'm uh, a new buy for in them. Okay, so the first one I want to talk about is platform as code, um, and the idea with platform as code is that you know you code the platform, and by platform I mean the system. You know, I mean the the actual yeah system and software that that you run over just thinking about this is the infrastructure, this is the application, this is the business logic. You can think about that as a, as a single thing. Um, and you tend to use a single language to define the system as a whole. Yeah? So you don't use two language, one for infrastructure, one for the application. And you tend to run those kind of in a single CI, CD pipeline. Like, you know, you deploy one thing, poof, you get your application done. Now, you might say some of those characteristics here are what we can uh, observe in serverless application as well. That is true. But um, in terms of the single language, that's not really the case. In terms of you know, thinking in, in, in terms of platform instead of kind of infrastructure and application, you don't, really, you don't really see that. But yeah, so I guess that's kind of uh, the idea. Um, and so I don't know how many kind of business critical applications will be written in this way into the future. I think this is kind of, you know, um, 
potentially a little bit you know, further away. But uh, yeah, I guess my prediction is that you know, this is where we are, we are going. And this is why I think like, potential infrastructure as code as it is today, it might be changing you know, significantly into the future. That's all I had, I guess, with the, with the 30 minutes. So if you need, have any questions, come and see me, because I think we don't have time for questions, right? Great, thank you very much.